as you can see, we have uh, three uh, significant institutions here. Actually, we're, we, I'll have to, there's an asterisk that, I'll, that I will take you through, as we'll start down at the, the far end is Zach Fries, the Senior Director at Walmart Sustainability, Kara Hurst, who uh, is the Head of Worldwide Sustainability at Amazon. That sounds just enormously complicated. <laughs> And Miranda Ballantyne, whose uh, very recent day job is at the uh, running the Business Renewable Center at the Rocky Mountain Institute, but is here on this panel representing her old job, which is the uh, Assistant Secretary of uh, Defense at the Air Force, Secretary of the Air Force, uh, in charge of renewable and energy uh, efficiency, and uh, left her job on or about December, uh, January 20th at noon. Um, <clears throat> To be precise. <laughs> so, so, uh, so she's going to be um, speaking from that perspective. And so, so three very large uh, procurement, uh, market making uh, organizations that uh, have significant have commitments to sustainability in general, uh, and renewable energy and efficiency in particular. Uh, but also packaging and, and a whole range of other things that we're going to talk about in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And uh, so I wanted to just sort of talk, first of all, uh, let's start down with, with you, Zach, down at that end. Um, so I, feel, I think it's going to be a little bit different for each of your institutions. What's the principal driver for what you do at Walmart in terms of sustainability? Yes, yeah, since, you know, since 2000. Five, uh, Walmart has been on our sustainability journey, and it wasn't really until then when we uh, decided to, to take it head on based on Hurricane Katrina and the response that we had back then, which was we are in thousands of communities in the, in the U.S. We have a role to play, and, and we used our scale for good. We used our, um, our, our power to really try to uh, bring goods and services to that town that so desperately needed it. And I think we realized at that point that the impact we could make if we, at scale, if we can, you know, if we can get ahead of this and be proactive yeah. to work on sustainability and, um, and, and environmental and opportunity agenda um, for the associates, not only that we have in our stores, but also the communities that we serve, can make a big difference. And it makes a good, sen good sense for business. And so yeah. for us, I think that, you know, that, that was really what kicked it off. And I would say since then, we've made a lot of progress. We've learned a lot, but with our aspirational commitments on sustainability that we've made, um, we, we feel that that has positioned as well as a company and it's going to position as well for the, the years to come. So how has that, the drivers changed since then? You started off with the hurricane, you realized that you, had, you, you, you could make a difference, you realized that that was good for lots of things, for the world, for your employees, your associates, for your customers, uh, for your image. Uh, and uh, what, what's, how's that driver changed now? Yeah, well, I, th I think it, you know, at the beginning it was, I mean, I, th and I think it was a, probably a provocative statement, Walmart and sustainability back in 2005. It was probably a shock to most people. Yeah. Um, and, I, uh, you know, at the time it was probably, well, it's a, you know, there's a ambitions that Walmart will never actually achieve. And I think over the years we've made a lot of progress and we're at 25% towards our goal of 100% renewable energy as a, as a global entity. That's a pretty, we still have a long way to go, but that's, that was a really good step. And now we're really positioned to where it's shared value and the way we talk about it with our shareholders, uh, you know, it makes good sense for business, it makes good sense for society. It, it, there is a strong business case to be made, be it renewables, the products that we sell. And I think that that's, that's changed and evolved over the years based on the lessons that we've, that, that we've learned. And it's kind of gone from aspirational commitments that we didn't quite know how to figure out to now we've got, we've got a path, we were setting hard targets, and we're working with our suppliers collaboratively to work on the things that we can't change yeah. alone. And we'll come back to some of those. Uh, Kara, uh, uh, Amazon seems to have gone, I want to say zero to 60, but it's really zero to 100. Uh, and, and it, it just sort of what drove that initial push that led them to hire you and for you to uh, uh, create what may well be one of the largest uh, sustainability departments of any company that I know of. Um, it's a significant effort. Talk about what, what was the driver? How did that begin? Yeah, well, thanks for, for having me here and um, for this conversation. It's, it's an exciting thing at Amazon. Um, I came in three years ago, almost, almost to the day, actually. And um, I, you know, I think there had been pockets of sustainability living within Amazon's business since the very beginning. And there's a couple of things that drive that. One is you'll hear us talk a lot about customer obsession, and that's what drives everything at Amazon. How do we think about our customers 
And Jeff talks about it in the way of using our scale, so similar, um, you have to use your scales, your scale and our inventive culture on behalf of our customers to, in, to solve their problems um, or to meet their needs or to think up things that you didn't know you wanted. So I think um, sustainability has always been that a similar thing. Um, we're a frugal company, we're a cost-effective company. Um, a lot of opportunity in sustainability is to drive waste out of operations, drive waste out of packaging, drive waste out of the ways um, in which you know, we can be more efficient with natural resources or other resources. And so a lot of those things were already happening if they weren't called sustainability. And I think there was um, an understanding that it would be about time to pull that together and see if we couldn't get some of the systems thinking and maybe more of a holistic view around a lot of that activity that was already happening within the company. So it was a timing piece in part, um, but I think it was also an opportunistic piece to think we could also bring something to this at Amazon, bring our inventive culture to it, um, and help tackle some of the world's biggest problems. Yeah, scale, yeah. And, and just for the uninitiated, anyone who landed from Mars, Jeff is Jeff Bezos. Oh, the, the CEO yeah. and the uh, the editor in chief of the Washington Post and, and the head of the produce department at uh, Whole Foods. Now. He's got a rocket company yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Miranda, and it's obviously a very different value proposition at the United States Air Force. But uh, what's driving uh, this? Uh, we'll, and we'll get to some of the, the scale, things you've done at scale, but this uh, pretty impressive push for renewables. So I think, in some ways very much similar to my colleagues on the panel, that it's all about the mission. You know, both Amazon and Walmart talked about their mission being front and center to their sustainability efforts. In the United States Air Force, obviously our mission is slightly different. Our mission is to protect the American people and our allies. It's to prevent war around the world, maintain global stability around the world. So when I was in the Pentagon, we very rarely talked about sustainability and environmentalism and, or any of those kinds of things, to be quite frank. But what we did talk a lot about was natural infrastructure and the ecosystem services that natural infrastructure can provide to the military mission. Um, just in the United States Air Force alone, I had 9 million acres of land. I had 50,000 buildings, 615 million square feet, which is about all of Walmart US. I had 114 endangered and threatened species on the land that I was charged to care for. We had a greater density of threatened and endangered species than any other public land across the country. This is, has nothing to do with the theaters of which you were operating. No, no, this, this, is is just, the... this is just in the United States. But natural infrastructure, for watersheds that are functioning, forests that are functioning actually support the military mission. I've got a lot of great examples of that. Second, we talked a lot about uh, resiliency to the changing weather patterns, shifting pat weather patterns around the world and the impacts to our mission. Uh, and I have some great stories around that as well. And then in the energy space, renewable energy is really a supply chain free source of electrons that I can have on base to ensure my mission even if the grid goes down. So yes, it's wonderful that it's clean. It's wonderful that it's cheap. But from the United States Air Force perspective, what I was really focused on was there's no supply chain that an adversary can disrupt. They can dis an adversary can disrupt my diesel. Oh yeah. An adversary can disrupt the grid. They can't disrupt the sun. They can't disrupt geothermal from underneath the base. They can't shut off my wind. So those are the kinds of things that we thought about, maybe a slightly different angle than the private sector. So so you've got these three uh, major institutions and and that have made uh, major commitments uh, across a, a spectrum of things. It would seem like you could, and I think can, the conventional wisdom is that you, you, know, you snap your fingers and people say, you know, literally, you know, <laughs> how high they, they stand up and salute. Uh, that in terms of, you know, specking, uh, uh, whether it's in the ag supply chain for you, uh, whether it's in, in chain transforming packaging uh, or, or, or data centers, um, and, and all of the things that, that, you're, that you've brought from buildings and, and facilities and, and vehicles and everything else. I don't get into the, you know, how, what, what does it take to, to transform a supply chain to really do what you need to do? So, uh, I mean, Zach, we'll just go back to you. Uh, you know, where do you find that it, it, it works, it's easy, and where do you, what are some of the challenges in getting suppliers to do what you would love them to do to help you meet your sustainability objectives? Mm -hmm. 
Well, there, there's a lot of challenges in, in, in supply chains, as you noted earlier. And I think that we're quickly becoming aware of the opportunities that exist in the space. And I think um, with the top tier companies that you work with, I think you see a, a, a quick adoption. We see, we've seen a lot of progress. I think it starts to drop off when you get into the, to the long tail and when you get into com companies that are, are, are global and do have complex organizations and especially tier one, tier two, you start going back in the, in the, in the value chain, um, it does present some opportunities to, to communicate the expectations properly, but also to help them you know, bring them along the journey and remove any barriers that you can. So one of the things we're working on is Project Gigaton, which is a massive goal that we have to reduce a billion metric tons from uh, greenhouse gas emissions from now until 2030. In order to achieve that goal, we have to get everybody involved. And so we're working a lot to try to remove barriers where we can to make things simpler for our suppliers and all the different areas that you mentioned, agriculture, energy, waste, and share the things that we've learned, share the things that suppliers have learned, but it's not something we can tell them to do. They have to see the benefit themselves. There has to be a business value. It has to make sense for them to do it. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. Isn't that just your, uh, the, the Walmart way, the, the, the way you've chosen to do this, that you are, you're asking them to you know, consider doing things this way as opposed to saying, we expect this and these are our procurement specs? Isn't that sort of your choice? Well, there are some things like in our private brand business where we do have more control, and we have some specific goals around that. 100% yeah. uh, recyclable packaging by 2025 is one of our goals in that area. Uh, deforestation commitments all apply there. But when you, when you start opening it up to all national brands, it, it, it's something we're encouraging. We're, we, we want to show them the case that it makes sense for them to do it. It's good for business. It's good for society. If we can show that example and they, and they take that step with us, then we're, we're, we're going to be very excited. Can you give an example of where something you just haven't been able to, to break through? I think, you know, we're, we're at an interesting point in the supply chain where we've, we've got the customer on one end, right, and we've got the supplier on, on, on one. So we, we are agents for the customer, and so going to, the, going to that first-tier company is, is sometimes easy. But when you start talking about factories and you start talking about farms, where you know change needs to happen, it, it becomes difficult for a retailer to make, that, to make that happen. So it takes bringing in others, bringing in partners to try to move as fast as we can because you know, communicating with a farmer, why it makes sense for him to use more sustainable agriculture practices, it's a little difficult for yeah, Walmart. And there's a lot of steps in between. A lot of steps in between. So Kara, it seems you're two big, two of the big areas that, that uh, you're taking on are energy, data centers primarily, um, and packaging, which you know is, is, is your face to the world, as well as obviously the, the vehicle delivery vehicle. What? How do you see? Which which one of those two are you finding the most challenging? I don't know if you can say one's more challenging than the other. Um, I think we um, certainly we did start with areas in um, energy and environment and packaging, um, in part because those are you want to start with you know where your material impacts are. And for us, I think the energy piece, um, AWS, our uh, data center business, Amazon Web Services, um, has been at this for a long time. We're doing uh, large utility scale projects. Um, we've now done one for all of Amazon. We have an Amazon uh, goal to power um, our AWS business with 100% renewable, and we're 40% we're there. So there's been a lot of progress in that area. So I would say, um, we're continuing down that road. We've made some inroads also looking again at, you know, utilizing our operational footprint. We have a lot of fulfillment centers all over the world. Um, and we set a goal out this past March of 50 rooftops by 2020. So we're trying to think about, you know, how to utilize what we have and, um, and also contribute to um, promote the scale of renewable energy. But in packaging, I think we, you know, equally had a number of different things. And as I said, these things have been sort of in existence at Amazon um, for a long time, certainly predates um, the arrival of the sustainability team formally, but we have a, a frustration-free uh, packaging program, um, and it's been about 10 years. Um, another uh, thing that Jeff Bezos invented, and it's got tenants to it around 100% recycled packaging, no clamshells, no twist ties, easy to open, good for the customer. Um, and we've been building on those to really take a look at 
um, you know, as e-commerce grows in general, where can we contribute to better e packaging for the e-commerce supply chain? How can we partner with our vendors? Um, and that, I think, has just been maybe a little bit newer for the sustainability team. So uh, I don't know that it's more difficult, but we had a lot to put our hands around in terms of big data. We had a lot of information that we needed and didn't have. Um, and the scale of the business is so big to step into that and have to put your arms around that kind of data and the technology that takes and um, what we needed to do to even make changes within our system um, in addition to thinking through what the customer experience would be with some of those packaging programs is really challenging. Yeah. I would imagine uh, all three of you uh, are seen uh, or perceived rightly wrong and I'd like to get a reality check on this as early adopters. Uh, of, of looking at technologies and saying, well, you know, we can make it work here, we can scale it internally and, and, and help make a, a market for, for, for the company or for the technology. Well, what's the Air Force's take on it? Do you, at what point do you willing to take a bet and, and look at something and try it out? So we think of all these problems really through a th sort of a three-step process. Um, first is understanding, and I liked the conversation earlier on the stage about the importance of understanding. Uh, you have to be careful not to get into analysis paralysis and think too much about a problem, but understanding the, the, the true depth of a vulnerability or a problem that you're trying to solve before you go and create technological solutions. But the second step is to rapidly deploy and scale the things that we can do today. So rapidly deploying utility scale solar, rapidly deploying on roof solar. You know, we know how to do these things today rapidly deploying LED lighting and energy efficiency. But the third piece is pushing tomorrow's technologies. And the Air Force actually has goals around pushing tomorrow's technologies, which you might think means the latest and greatest fighter jet, the latest and greatest drone, the latest and greatest in laser warfare and that type of thing. But also from the perspective of energy and environment means the latest and greatest in energy. Um, and so there are a number of programs, actually it's the fastest way to do business with the federal government are through R&D programs. Each of the three services have research labs that have areas of focus that are just on pushing tomorrow's technologies in energy um, and in a range of other environmental issues. For example, we've been looking at um, how, how to take waste and turn it into energy in a net positive way, which is actually a lot harder than you think it is because of composition of waste, but that solves multiple problems. Is that on a base or in the field or both? Both, yeah. uh, but the real application is re for the Air Force is really a forward operating base where you have a couple of problems. You've got bases that are far, far forward that are creating waste and, cre and right now you burn it and that creates a heat signal which sends a signal to the adversary, hey, we got a base here, you want to solve that problem, and it creates all sorts of uh, environmental pollutants and health hazards. And so, and then you have a problem of getting diesel or jet fuel to these forward operating bases to create power. Yeah. So if we could really crack that code to, to take a, a multi-waste stream that's not a perfect waste stream and, and actually have a net positive energy output. So we, our Air Force Research Labs look at that type of thing. Kara, I must imagine every entrepreneur who has some uh, better mousetrap must be beating a path to your door. Uh, how do, what's the process and, and how do you, particularly through this lens of sustainability, um, what, what's your take on early ad adopters and trying to you know, both help in, in ways that both help an entrepreneur and also further your cause? Yeah. Um, no, it's definitely been an interesting position to be in. I mean, we, we hear from lots of folks who have great ideas um, and they all sound really good. Um, and of course, with us, there's a couple of things. One is, can you grow with us? Um, and that's really true of any partnership that we form, whether it's with an NGO, a multilateral partnership, or a technology partnership. Um, scaling with us is important. And um, so understanding what that might look like from the outset uh, over the long term, because for us, I think even if it would work on one site and we might be able to you know, implement a technology or try something out, um, if we don't think there's a bigger roadmap in front of that, then it, you know, we have to get a trade, trade off time. Um, but I do think that there are, the, the flip side of that is at Amazon, um, just with our culture and our willingness to fail fast, our willingness to try things, learn from them, keep moving through it. Um, 
I have, I have never been in a culture that is so willing to do that. And I think it's, it's exciting. And so people are willing to try things. They're willing to, you know, what we call dive deep and get in the operations, understand things. Um, we do a lot of, you know, uh, I spend a lot of time out of the office. Um, and so does my team, right? We spend a lot of time in our own operations, learning, doing waste audits, or, you know, thinking about how operations work, spending time with the machinery, um, with the automation we're putting in. And so we know those processes really, really well. And um, we're willing to try things that we think we could, you know, maybe we're a good test lab and then we can help to scale it up. And, and you've got your own R&D operation within sustainability. Can you give an example of something that you, you're proud of that you've helped bring to market or that you think is gonna work? I don't know if there's anything so far that we've brought to market. I mean, we certainly have some packaging innovations and some material innovations that will come to market. Okay. Um, yeah, we're a, we're a different type of sustainability team in that sense, which has been really fun. Um, so within my organization, in addition to having great folks who are working on um, programs and um, strategy and kind of the... Um, you know, thinking about what we should be, would be tackling at Amazon, um, we have a sustainability technology team, so about 40 software developers that are writing code and writing software and creating technology um, that is implemented within Amazon. We also have Wait, a team. With, those programs are just within, embedded within sustainability? That's just for sustainability. Wow. And then we have, um, many of you know Dara O'Rourke, and he heads our sustainability science and innovation team. And we have um, LCA specialists, we have behavioral economists, we have folks looking um, at the science and innovation and R&D side of a lot of the challenges that we're facing as well. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a different spin, but very Amazonian. Wow, well, we got the Air Force here and an army over here. That's amazing. <laughs> so, so Zach, uh, how about you and the early adopters? Are there, you must, again, get a lot of uh, incoming. Uh, are you finding that you're able to take things, uh, in, in, particularly in the local, since you uh, have you know, local and regional hubs, um, to, to take innovations and bring them to scale? Yeah, I, I think we're, you know, I think that's one of the fun things about setting big aspirational goals that you don't know how to get to is that your executives are willing to try things that they might have not otherwise try. So it has allowed us to explore and, and, and test new things out. I think on the, with our, uh, some of our fleet goals for a sustainable fleet, um, as well as some of our renewable energy work, uh, globally and, and even on the product side, I think we're you know we're interested in in you know how do we bring the customer along with us? Uh, what are we willing to kind of try out? See what they're interested in? There's some things we want to do uh, because it just makes good business sense, and there's some things we just we might want to tell the customer about and see what they think. Can you give so, an example of anything where you just you know th we we tried this, it worked, and and you helped make a market? Uh, you know, I, 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 for us on the fleet side, I think that was one of the one of the big goals from a sustainable uh, trucking fleet. We've um, we have very large private fleet, as you know, and so for us scaling the auxiliary power units and some of the things that made our truck fleet more efficient, more cases per mile, Less those things make a big difference when you talk about the number of miles that we ship. So those are, those are the kind of things, to Miranda's point, once you, once you find them, you, know, you want to scale those as quick as you can. And then some of the fun things you want to play around with, too, are maybe to come, but um, we hope to continue down the path of yeah. finding more we're, things. We're to. about to get the hook, and, and, and these guys need to, need alcohol. So I wanted to ask you, um, uh, uh, maybe we do too, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> really quickly, each of you, what's on your wish list? If you, could, if you could create some innovation that would just, you know, what's a game changer for you that you could, if you could manifest? Anybody? I wish I had something to say as my wish list, but no. <laughs> I, I would wish for off-the-shelf cyber-secure microgrid technologies. Off-the-grid. Si Off-the-shelf. Off-the-shelf. I'm sorry. Off-the-shelf. Off-the-shelf. Uh, cyber-secure cyber -secure microgrid, microgrid technology. That's a great answer. Yeah. That's a good answer. I think I, I, would, I would like... Um, better technology, and we're working on this. We have something called Amazon Access we've launched in our supply chain, but better technology um, to help on the human rights and labor side um, of our uh, private label manufacturing. Um, I've been working on these issues for a long time, and many of you in the room have. Um, and I think, you know, we talk a lot about climate and the environment and sustainability as environmental issues, but um, our teams also manage social responsibility and um, I think some of those issues continue to be really intractable and really difficult. 
And I think that's a really, just an interesting area where technology is going to make a big play. And I'm really excited about it. If I guess my wish would be to accelerate that yeah. um, and, see it, and see it happen, so. Great. Um, yeah. Zach, what's on your wish list? I, you know, I, I think one of the, the, the big challenges that we face as an industry is that our, uh, I think a lot of companies have some deforestation commitments. And so I think that is coming quickly and I think there's a lot of tech, a lot of places technology can play to help get there faster to make sure we know where our, the risk in our supply chains where it exists there's some great tools out there but it we, we need that to accelerate we need more information in that space to really solve that issue so that's something I wish was great my wish was that we had another 25 minutes but we don't so for now please join me in thanking Miranda Kara and Zach <laughs>